This podcast is brought to you by VinZero. VinZero pioneers solutions and services to the AEC and manufacturing industries to support net zero targets. Visit VinZero.com to learn more about how organisations design, build and solve through digitalisation. From VinZero to you, welcome to our Think Future podcast series. Each week, we'll share conversations with industry leaders from around the world to find out how they're thinking future. Subscribe to VinZero Think Future for access to more episodes, interviews and profiles. Romilly Maju is Engineers Australia Chief Executive Officer and was previously CEO of Infrastructure Australia overseeing the organisation's critical role in helping governments prioritise projects and reforms that best serve our communities. In addition, Romilly served as CEO of the Green Building Council of Australia for 13 years and in acknowledgement of her contribution to Australia's sustainable building movement, she was awarded an Order of Australia in 2019. Romley joins the conversation today to share her thoughts on the current and future state for the engineering fraternity in Australia. Welcome to the program, Romley. Thank you. Looking forward to the discussion. Romley, there's a massive amount of infrastructure projects planned in Australia in the coming years. What do you think the impact is going to be for the engineering community? Yeah, great question. Look, the impact is multifaceted, really. Uh, when you look at the value of just the infrastructure pipeline alone, it's $237 billion over the next five years. So the impact covers across a couple of things. The firstly is skills. Uh, we really don't have enough engineers to be able to be involved in all those uh, projects. So more than 50,000 engineers are estimated to be needed in the next five years. But the issue is when you look at our vacancy rates, there's an 80% increase in our engineering vacancy rates nationally. So you can already see there's this disconnect between the pipeline and the amount of engineers that we have available to help build that pipeline. And then I'm just going to add another point to that. When you build these projects, you also need the use of technology and materials. And when you're looking at technology, for instance, whether that's a tunnel boring machines and the technology around managing the tunnel boring machines, A, we also have a supply constraint and there's supply constraints and logistics constraints globally and then the engineers needed to support those materials as well you're also challenged by uh, having access to the experts in their field to ensure that you're using the materials correctly or the technology correctly so really what the impact is uh, it's going to mean that the project's going to be over time and over budget So lots of challenges there for sure, with so many disciplines required to meet these project demands you're describing. What are Engineering Australia looking to address for the industry? Engineering is really interesting in that people say we need to be focusing on getting more students to be studying at university, but it really starts at school. You need to really be ensuring that our school students are studying maths and science, specifically physics. Not only that, that we have dedicated teachers who are trained in maths and physics and we know through a number of reports coming from the government that the quality of our teaching staff in maths and science compared to our global competitors is reducing. So at a school level, Engineers Australia is really working with the government and academia and schools to ensure that A, that we are showing to parents, teachers and career advisors the importance of getting students to be studying and B, to ensure that the quality is increasing. The next one is really around ensuring that we dispel the myths around maths and physics and really looking at attracting girls into maths and physics at school and the exciting opportunities that presents. When we look at why people choose to study engineering at university, nine times out of ten it's because a family member is an engineer. And so when you look at that at a socioeconomic scale, or young women, you can't be what you can't see. So if young girls don't see role models, if female engineers, then we're really struggling to attract them to university. If we look at the statistics of female engineers in Australia, it's woefully low at 16%. It's going to take us 70 years to get parity. So one of the other things Engineers Australia is doing is being very aggressive in promoting engineering, promoting gender equality in engineering, uh, the opportunities for women in engineering and the roles that they can play. So then that feeds into the next point of what we're working on, which is the brand of engineering. There's a, a really 
big piece that we're doing at the moment, not on our own. We're doing it in a coordinated and collaborative approach in working with across the engineering profession, specifically the industry, to really look at the brand of engineering, dispel the myths and show the exciting opportunities that engineering is. And that means for them to understand a couple of things. Firstly, there are different types of engineering. So there's mechatronics, there's biomedical, there's marine, software, so much more. There is just so many different areas of engineering. And we know the younger generation want to make a difference. We know that that's what's really a burning platform for them. And that's what engineers do. They make a difference. So it's really the onus is on us to highlight these different opportunities and pathways. And then the next one is to really show that engineering isn't just having the engineering professionals who've done four years studying in engineering. There's also engineering associates and engineering technologists. So an associate is a two-year study and technologist is a three-year study. So it's really using this brand campaign to say, if you're an electrician, well, you could be an electrical engineer. Uh, You could convert your electrician training into being an electrical engineer. So it's highlighting the opportunities of pathways. And then the final one really is around retaining the thousands of skilled migrant engineers who are in Australia today, we know that only half of them are working as engineers. This week alone we did a skilled migrant forum in Queensland and we heard from a female engineer from India who now has a fabulous job at Oricon after applying for a 1,000 jobs. So we hear from the sector, oh, there's this big challenge in attracting engineers and there's this vacancy rate. But then on the other hand, we hear from thousands of skilled migrant engineers who are in Australia who have already been approved for their migration and skills assessment, which we have done on behalf of the government. So they have been approved as an engineer. We've approved their training and our capability and expertise from the country that they come from. And we've approved that they speak English that we need in our job market. And what was really sad about this panel from three skilled migrant engineers is they said English is not the challenge, language isn't the challenge. There is an unconscious bias against skilled migrant engineers. So a big piece of work that Engineers Australia is doing. So what do you believe it will take to turn that around? So I touched on the rebranding of engineering and I think that's one of the areas that we'll really take to turn around. When we look at skilled migrants, there's a couple of things that we're working on. We're working with multicultural organisations within the states and territories. We've introduced a global engineering program that we are introducing. So it's a six-week training course for the skilled migrant that we run and then it's a 12-week internship that we partner with industry and government to get these skilled migrants into the workforce because we know from the research that we've undertaken that some of the feedback we receive is, oh, they don't understand our standards, they don't understand the Australian market, they don't have any networks in Australia. So we're hoping by this 18-week program that we're helping achieve and cross some of those barriers off for the skilled migrant. And we know from programs that we've run that that is the case. Once we get them into um, businesses, the businesses see how fabulous they are and nine times out of ten they then retain those skilled migrants. So then the other opportunity is really around creating more flexible pathways in engineering and that's about retaining engineering talent. So we know for a number of reasons. One is uh, whether females or males have care responsibilities and they leave the profession for caring responsibilities. So we work really closely and we partner with STEM returners and it really facilitates mentors for candidates on this program and provide candidates a year-long membership to help them reconnect with the profession because we really want them to return to the profession. We want them to welcome them back into the profession in any shape or form that they want. I think one of the things that COVID has shown us is there are more opportunities now for STEM returners to work from home. If they do have caring responsibilities, there's much more flexible opportunities for them now than there probably was pre-COVID where people were quite conservative in their approach that, you know, you need to be in the workforce. So we work with STEM returners to help work with engineers who've taken a break, as I mentioned. So we know in working with STEM returners that STEM returners attracts diverse talent with 46% of STEM returners being female and 34% from minority ethnic groups. 
And is there a role for regulation or policy to address any of these challenges as well? There are a number of levers that the governments, both state and territory and federal, can play. So the first one really is, when you're looking at the migration system, is to overhaul the skilled migration system to ensure migrant skills fill a need and to minimise unemployment and underemployment. So we're attracting skilled migrants into Australia, but we want to make sure we're attracting the skilled migrants with the engineering skills we need. So it's not just the skilled migrants who've completed their engineering degree and then want to come to Australia. We're also looking at skilled migrants. So that's just engineers with a degree. When we talk about skilled migrants, it's tunnelling, signalling, so five to ten years experience in those areas that we know we have a massive gap in, you know, civil, structural, mechanical, geotechnical. So it's making sure that the migration system is supporting those skilled migrants. We also want to make sure it's flexible because we know for a fact that we attract these fabulous skilled migrants into rural and regional Australia and then all of a sudden after three years it's like, well, you can go now. We're like, but but infrastructure projects take 10 to 15 years. We need to have a flexible system to ensure that we're not only attracting them but it's a stable market for them that when they come they stay because an employer is not going to take on a skilled migrant who's not going to be known to be able to stay for some period of time to complete a program and we are working with the federal government on this but it's really ensuring that the migration system is flexible. The next one is that government can use its procurement processes. They are the procurers and the majority of this major infrastructure pipeline. So use your power in your procurement power to be ensuring that we are taking on the opportunities of using skilled migrant and all that we're using females. Uh, They can use their procurement power in setting targets and quotas within the procurement and that they work really collaboratively with these projects to say, we appreciate that we're asking you to bring on increased number of females or increased number of skilled migrants and that's where they can work with Engineers Australia to help with that pipeline so that we know that they need these skilled migrants we know that they're there so we work in partnership together but procurement is really a key trigger and I'll give you an example of that if you think about safety and sustainability procurement has been a wonderful lever to show massive change and leadership in improvement of safety You know, they've embedded that into procurement. Why not embed some of these elements into procurement? And the final one is we want to attract engineering students into the profession. We want them to study at university. And we know that financial aid is a reason because it's a four-year degree if they are doing an engineering profession degree. We also know that now that because of the gap in the challenges we have in retaining engineering students, that industry is being very aggressive in going into university and literally grabbing them in year two. And so all of a sudden, if you're not quick, if you're not quick to jump into um, university and grab them, you'll lose them. But we also want to make sure that those students who have that maths and science skills feel that they financially can study engineering. So we're really looking at increasing the financial support to engineering students. It is burning platform that we need these engineering students. So we need governments to support them financially to attract them to study engineering in the first place. So the first challenge is the war on talent. But the second major challenge is we know that there's heaps of students out there who are interested in studying engineering and don't have the foot in the door in the first place. So A, we want to increase the number of students studying engineering. B, we know that financial aid can help them that. And C, we want a competitive market of ensuring that it's a competitive market, not this war on talent that we have at the moment. Are you looking for a digitalisation and net zero partner to help you achieve your goals? Join the thousands of AEC and manufacturing customers globally who have turned to VinZero to start their journey toward a net zero future. With 32 offices around the world, VinZero can connect you to the right technologies and workflow processes, so you can maintain your competitive position and increase profitability. VinZero has an industry expert to help you navigate the best pathway forward 
wherever you are on your digitalisation and net zero journey. Visit thinzero.com to find out more. So let's talk about innovation. You mentioned AI. What types of innovations are being applied to solve the demand versus supply issue aside from the ones we're describing around talent? We have nine colleges at Engineers Australia and one of our colleges is Information Telecommunications Electronics Engineering College. And they are really thinking deeply of what the future looks like. So engineers have many problems to solve. And AI, for instance, artificial intelligence, cannot replace the combination of emotional intelligence and human skills, but it's still critical to engineering work. So I'll give you an example. We know that we have a challenge around the number of engineers and that we need more. So where we see that AI and um, para-engineering, which I'll touch on in a minute, can help is to ensure that an engineer focus on the key elements that they need to focus on in the role that they're playing in that specific job. So just say, let's talk about tunnelling. So that the engineer is focusing on those key elements that AI can't cover. But there's other areas that engineer could delegate, whether technology delegation, offshoring delegation, or delegate to a power engineer So they're focusing on their key skills, but some of their other skills, their management skills or their other skills can be delegated to either through a technology lens or through a paralegal. So we know there's paralegal, so we're looking at para-engineering so that we are delegating some of those other skills to other people and that's where the yet power and the use of technology can come into play. Robotics is another one. We were up at an advanced robotic manufacturing, it's called Arm Hub in Queensland. We were up there this week on Tuesday having a site visit and it's called co-robotics where you're using the engineer in collaboration with the robot to deal with these key issues because the robot is only so clever. You do need that human element when it comes into some of these areas that we're dealing with. And I think there's a lot of exciting work being done in this co-robotic field. So Engineers Australia is really playing a part in identifying the opportunities, working with key players across the platforms and really showcasing these opportunities as well. The role of power engineering is around para professionals. And so we assist in qualified and licensed professionals in those roles, like you do with a paralegal. So greater use and understanding of all occupational categories of engineers will help to alleviate the reliance on the professional engineer. And then the second point of that is para engineering. The other one is really that there's three occupational categories in engineering. People don't seem to realise that. That when they think of an engineer, they think, oh, the engineer's done four to five years study. They're really, they're an accredited and recognised like a chartered accountant. They're a recognised chartered engineer. But they're also wonderful and uh, very experienced engineering technologists who are accredited and recognised for three-year engineering technology degree or engineering associate, which is a two-year advanced diploma or associate degree of engineering. Give you an example. An engineering technologist and engineering associates are very heavily used in defence. So defence attract a huge, vast and array of people into defence and they may go down a specific field. So as I've touched on, they may train as an an electrician in defence and then defence will put them through as well an additional training in engineering technologist or engineering associate and they are recognised as an engineering professional. They are internationally recognised. So there's lots of opportunities for students who are looking and are interested in maths and science and may go, you know, I'm interested in a specific field and they can go and do a two or three year degree and still be recognised as an engineer. And all of these occupations are highly relevant and highly important within the engineering profession. So another area I want to touch on is micro-credentialing. So for those people who haven't heard the expression micro-credentialing before, it's really undertaking study and education in areas that might not be your subject matter expert. Engineers Australia through Engineering Education Australia has launched a number of micro-credentialing courses. Uh, Engineers Australia's micro-credentials assist engineers to ensure their knowledge and skills remain relevant to the very dynamic environment that we're in 
today. Micro-credentials show engineers that they meet criteria in specific subject matter experts and areas. And they developed in collaboration with industry and are designed to measure and assess engineers' results in the workplace. So I'll give you an example at the moment. The federal government has announced at AUKUS as a major project with the US, UK and Australia in nuclear defence engineering. So we have 115,000 members, engineering members in Australia, but there's only a handful that may have been trained in nuclear submarine engineering. So what a micro-credential really helps them is you could be a civil engineer, a mechanical engineer, or a structural engineer, and you all have a real interest in uh, nuclear submarine engineering. So a micro-credential will help you uplift your skill and help you with the opportunity to work in that new area of focus, which is a national priority for Australia. So what do you see would be the biggest game changer to turn around the perception of engineering in the broader sense that you've been speaking about? The first one really is around the brand of engineering, is really elevating the understanding of the importance of the profession. When you ask people to talk about the professions that they would hold in high regard or they acknowledge, nine times out of ten they'll say accountants, lawyers and doctors. But engineering is a critical profession in Australia and should be the first profession that people mention. Realistically being, engineering touches every facet of a person's life, every facet. A person sitting, looking at their computer, holding their phone, even picking up a cup of coffee, driving their car, you name it, engineering has a role to play in every person's life. So it should be the top profession that comes to mind. So a game changer really is the work we have around brand. The second one is when we think about the importance of senior leadership roles in Australia, whether that's boards, both government boards and corporate boards uh, on the ASX 200, for instance. You know, there was a lot of discussion years ago around the importance of having lawyers on a board, whether that's government or corporate. We believe that there is important to have an engineer on a board. Engineers are problem solvers. Engineers are trained to think of a number of critical issues and to bring all those critical issues together, and they're trained to be problem solvers. So realistically, when we're looking at these major boards around Australia and major committees or task groups, an engineer should always be considered. Or if it's not going to be an engineer, someone with STEM training, so science, technology, engineering or maths training, a STEM-trained person needs to be on these boards. It's critical. So we're working really closely with our STEM partners around Australia to highlight the importance of STEM, STEM training, and including an expert in STEM on boards. Another one really is, and we're really proud to be pushing this agenda, is having a seat at the table. Roundtables are constantly created by government, you know, a roundtable on carbon, a roundtable on technology, a roundtable on AI, a project on fast rails, a roundtable on hydro. There's all these roundtables by state and territories and the federal governments. On every single roundtable, there needs to be an engineer or a STEM professional. It is absolutely critical when these roundtables are created that the first thing they think about is, do we have the right professional on the table. So we're really pushing for a seat at the table, not just to be at the table, but that we drive the discussion at the table and that we turn it around to being seen as an active in the decision-making that's happening in Australia. We know that engineers have the skills, the analytical and problem-solving thinking ability, and so they really do need to have a seat at the table. So that's covering off the game changes in terms of brand perception. What about game changes for engineering in general that are going to disrupt the way we see projects run in the future? When we think about, and I I wouldn't even say about the future, it's happening now. You know, look how quickly chat GPT, no one knew what it was last year, and that has just moved at a fast rate. So Really, when it comes to these game-changing elements that are disrupting us now, a few big ones come to mind, so artificial intelligence, addictive manufacturing, so 3D printing, which will allow rapid prototyping and on-demand construction and iterative development, renewable engineering technologies, particularly advances in solar, wind and battery energy storing systems, virtual and augmented reality, VR and AR technologies and not just 
for gaming, you know, I know I've seen it at Cross River Rail, a project, deep engineering project happening up in Queensland where they're also using digital twins uh, and gaming all three together to ensure innovation is being used in that project. And then the final one really is the Internet of Things and the connections between all devices all the time, you know, huge benefits in real-time systems monitoring, data integration and so on. And just on that last one, you've just got to look at what came out of COVID. All of a sudden we were using QR codes. Half the population didn't know what a QR code was. We were using drones. The technology we were using, the data we were collecting, through COVID to ensure that we were safe, to ensure that our infrastructure sites were open. It showed that the importance of being involved and across all of this, an engineer was involved in this use of innovative technology. It sure did. So what challenges still need to be solved? The biggest challenge is around the skills challenge and the skills shortage, attracting engineers into the uh, sector, retaining engineers into the sector. And one would also be the culture of the sector. If we want women and skilled migrants to be attracted to engineering, then we need to make sure that we've got a safe environment for them to work in. So it's important that the culture of the sector is improved. Uh, And the other ones is ensuring that we're involved in the major challenges and national priorities of our time. Those include both climate net zero and clean energy transition, pathway to circular economy, global security and AUKUS that I've talked about, and artificial intelligence. And in every single element I just touched on, an engineer needs to be involved. And so it really is the challenges that we're seeking to solve, they will be solved by engineers and our STEM partners that we're working collaboratively with. So, Romilly, I have to ask, with all the passion and expertise you have for the engineering sector, when you think future about engineering, about the industry, what is it that excites you the most? What excites me is this is the decade of engineering, that people talk about engineering with respect. Uh, They see them as a highly regarded profession. And it's not made in jest. And, you know, you you hear that people um, for, unfortunately can hold in jest, oh, you know, that's typical of an engineer. Whereas, you know, we want to see engineering held in such high regard because they are, they're the problem solvers and they're the ones who are going to be helping us in these wicked, challenging problems. And I'm really excited because that change has already started. I had a feedback yesterday that someone said, oh, my God, All you hear about at the moment is engineering, the engineering professions in Engineers Australia. That really excites me because that means we're changing the conversation and the narrative around engineering. And I'm really excited about that because when we're talking about these wicked challenges, I want to ensure that the first thing that is said in that first sentence or that first paragraph and they'll be solved by the work that the engineers are doing. Well, Romilly Madhu, you are the best person to be at the helm for Engineers Australia. We thank you very much for sharing your passion, your enthusiasm and your experience and we look forward to the continued success for all engineers around Australia driving the major infrastructure developments we have coming our way. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. This podcast was brought to you by VinZero. VinZero helped the AEC and manufacturing industries keep pace with digital change and achieve their technological and sustainability leadership goals. VinZero is a company that cares about creating and building a better world. Together, we are working with industry and environmental experts, providing forums and platforms through our VinZero Think community to create conversations that matter to our future generations. We invite you to join in the conversation and participate in our Think community. Like and subscribe to Think Future to stay up to date with the latest innovations and conversations as we take AEC and manufacturing around the world closer to zero. You can download our podcasts at vinzero.com or from your favourite podcast platform. From Vinzero Think Future, thanks for listening.